Hi, I'm Dr. Jared Gardner. I'm an Associate Professor of Pathology and Dermatology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in Little Rock. And I'm here today with Dr. Richard Scolier, who is a Senior Staff Specialist uh, in Tissue Pathology and Diagnostic Oncology at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney, Australia. He's also a Conjoint Medical Director at Melanoma Institute Australia and a clinical professor at the University of Sydney. Dr. Scolier, thank you for joining us for this interview. No, it's great to be able to talk to you, Jared. It's really nice to meet you in real life and have a chance to chat. Um, and you're here at the American Society of Dermapath to give the Hellwig lecture this year, right? I'm thrilled and honored to be asked to present that lecture. And, and actually, it's my first trip to the ASDP oh, meeting. Oh, fantastic. And I must say, it, what, what I've seen so far, it's the best Dermpath meeting I've ever been to. It's wonderful. I've, I've been so lucky to be involved here since I've been a resident. I thankfully had senior residents and fellows say, oh, you should go. It's really great. And I've been coming ever since. It's yeah. been a wonderful place. Yeah, I'm sure I'll be back too. So your lecture, the Hellwig lecture this year is focusing on melanoma, right? And, and aiming towards the eventual goal of zero deaths. Is that what you're going to talk about? Yep. At Melanoma Institute Australia, our goal is zero deaths from melanoma. And we, be amazing. We, we believe we can get there during our working lifetime. That's awesome. So tell me, what, what role do you think pathologists play in that goal? I think realistically to get there we have to have a multi-pronged strategy and at uh, Melanoma Institute Australia we've aligned our research strategy basically around the patient journey. So we have five themes of research. Our first theme is around prevention and management of patients at high risk of getting melanoma. Our second theme is around early stage disease, improving detection and, and um, uh, accurate diagnosis mm -hmm. of melanoma, improving prognosis, prognostication of the disease. The third theme is around advanced melanoma, new ways to improve that. And there's been incredible advances that have been made over just, the past decade. Just since I finished fellowship, which was not that long ago, seven years ago, and, and it's just been like a night and day difference, which is incredible to see. Yeah, it, it is. And to be been a part of that has been an amazing opportunity and very rewarding. And um, I'm keen to talk more about that. And just to finish off the themes that of our research strategy to try and deliver on this goal. So the third theme around it, that's melanoma. And our fourth theme is around health economics because mm. we want to prove whatever we're doing is cost effective for yeah, the community. Very important. And our last theme is around supportive care and survivorship because now with more people who previously were dying of melanoma with them surviving that's presented a whole range of new yeah. problems that need to be need to be that's assessed. amazing that you guys are, are thinking about not just one avenue of research but all of those different areas that melanoma impacts our our life and, and our world so yeah. it's incredible we've got a great team of people who who dedicated to this goal and and together we'll get there that's wonderful well i'm excited to to hear that you're making such progress there and you do a lot of translation research in melanoma, and I know you're probably too humble to bring this up here, but my understanding is that Dr. Scolier has uh, 500 publications, and they've been cited 30,000 times, and he is uh, basically, I think at this point, the most highly published person on melanoma in the world, more or less, right? So, you know, you know, nice Whoa. work. <laughs> nice work on that. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, How do you do that? You do clinical practice. You run a melanoma institute or co-run co it. You take care of patients and diagnose things and then do all this research. What's the secret, man? How do you make that work? I think the secret is to surround yourself in people who are better than you and um, and work with them. Amen. Tr work, truthfully, you can't achieve anything on your own. You, you, I work with an amazing team of people who are very dedicated and 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 smart and work hard and, and that's how we achieve so much and I think in this day and age particularly in translational research you need to collaborate with people yeah. so that's what we do and, and I guess the other thing that's very important is our research is based on our on our patients and um, in Australia we're again very fortunate that pretty much every patient who comes to our institute, so we see more than 2,000 melanoma patients each year, they very generously agree to allow us to collect 
data on them mm -hmm. and also collect biospecimens from them and this is the fodder for our yeah. research and and they themselves often are not going to benefit from from this the generosity that they've shown to us but allows the next lot of patients to come through to benefit hopefully from the research that we're able to perform so and that's meaningful i think to those patients to know that it's really going to help someone in the future i've been really amazed to see particularly rare disease patients that they're just like we want to do anything we can to make life better for someone in the future and how, how inspiring I think for us as professionals to see when patients want to give in that way it's just yeah. it's wonderful. Well it's interesting you say that I read something that you'd read that you'd written or said Jared about one of the most rewarding things you'd found in your career was uh, when you got to interact with some patients with DFSP. Oh yeah. So for me as the co-medical director at Milan Institute Australia that's been a for a pathologist an incredible opportunity yeah. to engage more not just with medical colleagues outside of pathology but but also with melanoma patients and and and, and the community because it's very important to raise awareness of the disease um, we know that with melanoma if you recognize it and detect it early at its earliest stages most difference. patients will be cured so yeah. to get the message out there about the importance of dangers of the Sun also the importance to know your own skin and mm -hmm. so if you see something different patients go and get them checked and, and to talk to hear about their stories for for people who've lost loved ones yeah. to melanoma and, and and see what they've gone through yeah it's I think it's powerful right to, to hear the patient perspective and and we know the science and but to, to see the names and stories and have a name and a face that goes with the diagnosis, I think it really brings a lot of meaning and, and a lot of, you know, I don't know, emotional intensity in a good way to, to my work. It reminds me, this is not just a piece of glass, it's a person and, and this is why I do this job and it's worth it and yeah, it's cool. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and I'm, yeah, I'm very fortunate, I think, in some respects that it's not that uncommon for me to talk to patients That's awesome. about, their, about their disease and, and, their, and their specimens. Do they look at slides with you or want to see pictures of their tumor or what do they occasionally it's usually on the telephone um, oh, okay so sometimes patients I talk to directly when they ring me and and sometimes when they're in consultations with my clinical colleagues the colleagues will ring me uh, on the phone mm -hmm. during that consultation and we'll have a three-way discussion oh, about cool. the about the case and try and work out together what would be the best management for I'd them. love to incorporate more of that uh, kind of thing into my practice I think that would be it's just, it just all, everyone benefits, right? Everyone wins there when we're all on the same page. How did you get interested in melanoma to begin with? You know, what started you down this journey to get to where you are today? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So I came to work at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital in Sydney more than 20 years ago. And, and that's where the Melanoma Institute was based. And um, I worked with an outstanding pathologist called Stan McCarthy, who took me under his wing and, um, and seemed to um, like working with me. And he'd, he'd made some great observations, but didn't have the time to really examine them um, and, and, and document them. And um, I knew the melanoma unit had this incredible database of more than now more than 50,000 patients and having the follow-up of patients based with um, pathology material I could see was a great opportunity to, to try and make a difference. It's a so, gold mine of data, right? So wow. um, yeah, that's what got me interested and then opportunities sprang from that. I started working closely with the, the guy who was the head of the Melanoma Institute before Georgina Long and I became the co-medical director, John Thompson, who's a, a, a brilliant academic surgeon and, and we hit it off well and he again was a mentor of mine and now a great friend and, and colleague. That's cool. Why why does Australia have such a high incidence of melanoma and how much higher is it than, you know, kind of the average rest of the world? Yeah, I guess it's not something to be very proud of, but no, unfortunately but we've got the highest incidence of melanoma in the world. Australia and New Zealand sort of neck and neck and the reason is because we've got many people with pale skin like mine living in a place with such a beautiful climate exposing our bodies to the harmful effects of UV irradiation so it's yeah. basically a consequence of that and so yep we have the highest incidence of melanoma in the world it's uh, in fact the commonest cancer in young adults and really um, yeah we, wow. in our country which is it's a real problem because yeah 
that young people dying of melanoma is a disaster. It's yeah, people so terrible. in the prime of their lives, um, yeah, young yeah. families. We, um, it's yeah, a loss for society. Yeah that's, yeah. yeah, that's awful. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. I mean, it's good then that you guys are doing so much amazing work on that. Well, it's true that we have had much success, and and like up until a decade ago, there was no effective drug therapies for people with advanced melanoma. That's changed and, totally, right? Yeah. But still, you know, we've got a lot of work to yeah. do. We, the um, Up until a decade ago, I think the um, one-year survival rate was about... 25 percent for melanoma and, and now it's about once people have stage four or stage four melanoma mm -hmm. that's right yeah and it, obviously people with early stage disease that the um most of them will be cured hopefully um and now it's about one year survival for stage four is about 75 percent you know brain people with brain mets their median survival used to be about six weeks and and now much much, much improved so yeah it's been incredible, incredible to see that happen but despite that you know, still there's many people who don't respond right, to these uh, therapies, so we've still got a lot of work to do to, yeah. to deliver on this goal of zero deaths from melanoma. And That's I look forward to sharing where, how I think we're going to get there in the Hellwig lecture. Uh, that I'm really excited afternoon. to see that. That'll be awesome. Mm -hmm. So let me change gears a little bit. You recently were one of the editors on the WHO, World Health Organization, Skin Tumors book. So what is different about the new version of the WHO Skin Tumors? Or what are some of the main uh, things that came out of that? Yeah, that, that was a, a fun project to be involved with. So, um, you know, with many, many friends and collaborators around the world and the other editors of that um, textbook. To, well, particularly in melanoma there's we've developed a, a new classification of melanoma and, and really embraced the explosion of of data that's come about over the past 15 or 20 years and, and I think you know important to highlight the contribution particularly that Boris Bastian's made oh, in, yeah. in that field but we've embraced this idea that you know in the past we've, we've thought about basically that Melanoma is all one disease, but it's now clear that it's not based in, on clinical, pathological, and now molecular data mm -hmm. that it isn't one disease. And in fact, in the WHO, we've recognized that there's nine different pathways that we've identified so far for, to form melanoma, and and each one of those, there's some other sub-pathways within them, but yeah, I love they that are approach. different diseases. It's, it's really cool and, and logical to think of it that way. Yeah. I like that you guys did that. And, and the other thing that I think is really important that perhaps hasn't been highlighted so much is that, you know, we've thought in the past that it's it's either nevus or melanoma, and, and, and that's all, but it's clear that to get from benign to malignant like in other forms of cancer, there's a stepwise progression and um, we've recognised these you know, grey zone tumours, that you know, borderline tumours that where we have troubles in making a diagnosis. Some of those are, 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 are mimics. Uh, there's benign and malignant tumours that can look, 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 look the other. Yeah, yeah, and if you know the criteria, you can make the right mm -hmm. diagnosis. But there's another group of borderline tumours in which they are truly biologically intermediate in progression and we've embraced that in the WHO and 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 group them together under this rubric melanocytoma to to highlight them and I think that that's a, a important conceptual advance for the field and also assists us in um, in further research on these projects but also um, communicating with our clinical colleagues so this borderline tumors is not just pathologists can't make up their mind they truly are biologically sure. in intermediate so I think that's important so that's in melanocytic tumors there's some other important um, changes in the keratinocytic tumors um, I guess one thing that, that that I think is really practical and useful is in BCCs, the mm -hmm. commonest tumour in humans. Um, we've got various subtypes of, of BCCs, but we've um, we've um, made more concise definitions or made more robust definitions of the high-risk subtypes in particular because I think that was something that was lacking in the past and and um, yeah, I'm hopeful that that'll be very useful for our pathology colleagues in in diagnosing those yeah. very, very common tumours exactly. that we see every, and, every day. And often tumours that even though maybe they're not usually lethal, they really are very morbid to patients and, and not missing those forms that are more likely to be aggressive is so important, I think. 
think so. Yeah. What do you do when you're not doing all of this, when you're not working, researching, writing, and changing the field of melanoma um, along with your colleagues? What do you do in your spare time? What, what, whatever of it you have. Um, well, I, you know, I'm sure like, like you, um, Jared, I know you have three children like me, and you know, I love spending time with my wife and, and three kids. Um, they have busy lives like I do, and I guess it's a question of, of when you're with them, embracing those moments yes. and um, so important. It's hard to do, but it's so important. Right? Yeah, and and um, I think you know quarantining that time is very important, yeah. and uh, and and being you know efficient in what you do um, and focused and. Um, and you yeah. like to run a little bit too, I heard, right? Uh, triathlons, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I like, yeah, I'm very passionate about exercise and um, and and staying fit. Something that I've loved doing for since I was younger. And cool. Uh, in fact, yeah, many of my colleagues um, now are into exercising. And uh, in fact, we get together on Tuesday and Thursday mornings and 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 run together. As a team, and, huh? That's cool. Well, there's about twenty or thirty of us, wow. but not all pathologists or. or um, medical people, but you know, it's a great opportunity to meet other people and, and enjoy other aspects of your life and, and a fun way to stay fit and, and healthy. Well, I'll have to tell you that you, to be personally, are, are an inspiration. I think, I know it's hard to, to hear that, but I think it's really awesome to see someone who's been so successful in multiple areas and is still like the most down to earth and humble guy I've ever met, probably. So thanks for talking with me today and congratulations again on the Hellwig Lecture. Oh, great to meet you and um, yeah, congratulations to all that you've achieved you. as well, Jared. Thank you.